I want to get more on inflation with uh, with our Bloomberg Best Economist, fixed income strategist, uh, Guy LeBas with Jenny Montgomery Scott. I know, Guy, you're down here, or up here, I should say, for a Bloomberg conference as well. Um, are you worried about inflation as well? A little bit on the margin, but here's the issue. I would argue that inflation right now is probably a good thing. If producers are able to pass on higher prices to consumers, that means they don't have to cut back in other areas, such as hiring, which really remains, remains the key to continuing the economic growth that's already been started. The problem is runaway inflation. Well, where do you hit runaway? I think it's well above 1.8 percent. And we're not there yet, obviously. Not there yet. Uh, but, I mean, isn't, isn't any type of price increase right now going to derail economic growth? I mean, it's going to cut into spending? Not necessarily. I think one of the things we have to look at is the difference between, and not to sound like those same Fed economists, <laughs> the difference between oil and food prices and everything else. Not because they don't matter, but because these oil and food prices, they're like a tax to consumers. You can't get away from buying that heating oil. You can't get away from buying that dinner. Mm -hmm. So, as a result, that's where the cutbacks end up occurring, when there's inflation in those sort of tax tax-like items, not so much in other areas. 1.8% certainly isn't out of uh, line. It's sort of what the Fed's looking for. But it seems that the conversation on Wall Street's more about the speed, that inflation is picking up more quickly than maybe the Fed estimates. Right, and that's a very, very rapid increase. You know, our own forecast six months ago were probably for inflation below 1% in 2011. That's changed. That's come to the upside as well. And I, I think that speed is a little bit concerning. Unfortunately, inflation tends to be a really long-term phenomena, mm -hmm. and you can sort of see where the pressures are going, but it's really hard to see where they're going to end or where they're going to slow down. So, Guy, at what point do you think it's going to build up enough that it's going to seem unhinged at some point for the Fed to act? What well, has to happen? I think the key thing we need to look for is the markets right now. You referenced a few minutes ago the tips break even. The difference between inflation protected treasuries and regular treasuries is a way for the market to sort of interpret what inflation is going to be over the years. I think we really look heavily to that for expectations. Because hmm. the market's expectations, not just consumer expectations, that matter and that drive firms' policies and hiring. How concerned are you by consumer expectations? Because there was a big jump in the University of Michigan survey, which asked consumers what they think about expectations, and they're the ones who could drive a self-fulfilling inflation cycle. To a degree, if we take a look at the history of consumer inflation expectations going back to the early 1980s, the price of a Big Mac would be something like $6.50 <laughs> instead of the $1.70 or $2 it is today. So consumers have consistently, over the last 30 years or so, exaggerated what future inflation is going to be. So I think you need to take those expectations with a grain of salt. Because a consumer, you see those gas prices driving down the highway. Right. You don't see the fact that your rent check or your mortgage check hasn't gone up in two years. To what extent is what's happening in Japan uh, somewhat of a deflationary effect on prices? Is it? Potentially. Uh, you know, the Japanese economy is roughly 9 to 10 percent of world GDP. The kind of declines in output we're expecting for 2011 are in the neighborhood of probably about 6 percent of that 9 percent. So in the scheme of things, it's a relatively small portion of the whole, and it's not really eating into global demand. Mm -hmm. However, you know, we see a modest impact on energy prices. The problem is because of the nuclear sort of fallout, no, no pun intended, right. from that event, <laughs> There's a reverse effect. There's a move away from what was going to be a major source of alternative energy, which is driving, once again, higher energy prices in the mm, long run. Interesting. Uh, Guy, I know you're also here to talk about the muni bond markets, right? And we've been talking about the state of the states. Um, the topic you're discussing is this muni bond bubble, right? Uh, how much has all of what's happened in the bond markets actually made it more difficult or complicated to trade in the muni bond markets? Well, it's made it very complicated to trade, and I think philosophically many investors have moved towards a longer-term horizon as a result. But one of the really biggest problems we see is something called headline risk. And, hey, we're creating headline risk right now as we talk. Yeah. The idea that if you say something bad about an issuer in Iowa, bonds from New York City also decline because it's interpreted as an attack or an impact for the whole market. And that creates a very, very asymmetric profile, makes it hard to know when exactly these headline risks are going to come out. So then, okay, so if you're trying to differentiate then in the muni bond market, then, then where is an opportunity then in the muni bond market? Well, I think the opportunities are right now where things are a little bit quieter. In cities and states that are maybe a little bit off the radar screen. Like that where? Had, like States that I tend to like specifically, Minnesota, which has had a long okay. history of high income levels, high wealth levels. Texas, long history of fiscally conservative policies. And these sort of off the radar mm. type states. Guy, I'll see you later. Thank Excellent. you for joining Thank you, us. Ben.